Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is the, the notebook that I did. And there's always a, a learning opportunity with this, you know, with this stuff, because I didn't, uh, not in 100% R markdown, I'm using Quarto, okay? Quarto is the new, is the new R you know, markdown. And uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat because, you know, a lot of things that sometimes it takes, you know, a kind of a headaches, you know, in the R markdown, is that, is it, they're, they're easier here. So remember that when we were, uh, Andres was talking about the time series that he picked which was the unemployment uh, US. Uh, I picked this one, which is the S&P 500. That's, uh, that's an index for the stock market. And the S&P 500, you will see, especially in this plot, you will see that has certain similarities to the one that we were, we, we were studying the, the, the unemployment, which is a series that kind of goes, you know, all the way, you know, up, kind of a monotonic, you know, a series. So, uh, you know, it, it, it came from, uh, from an article. The article is there. If, if you open the notebook, uh, this is the link for the, you know, for, for the article exploring, uh, doing EDA, uh, data analysis, exploratory data analysis uh, of a time series. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure, because we're going to be seeing this in some of the next uh, chapters, are two, uh, you know, two assumptions that the algorithms for time series uh, uh, assume, okay? One of them is what is called heteroskedasticity, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is that some algorithms, especially ARIMA, the one that is, you know, the traditional uh, time mm -hmm. series algorithm uh, assumes, as in regression, assumes that the variance throughout the time series mm -hmm. is going to be uniform. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's something that you have to be uh, aware of it because mm -hmm. if that assumption uh, mm -hmm. is violated, okay, it's, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. it's not present, then you have to do certain transformations like a log transformation or a box cox that were, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, uh. but here, uh, the good thing about R, okay? And also, you know, also Python has it, but R is kind of uh, easier because it's rooted on statistics. So one of the things that R is very convenient is that there's almost any package for the test or the test that you want to. You know, you 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 want to you want to run. So for doing this kind of test, the heteroskedasticity test, which is we're test if that variable is uniform across the time series or if it's not uniform, right? And that's going to be our no hypothesis. If the variance is uniform, that's going to be our no hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis is that the variance is not uniform throughout the time series. Okay. So there's this neat package called called BPT BP test which has this uh, LM test, uh, you know, uh, the LM test packet has this BPT test, what is called the, the Broich uh, Pagan uh, test, which does that. It, it tests if the variance is uniform or not, okay? Mm -hmm. According to the, you know, the P value that you're going to see. So one of the things that I did, you know, following the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the article was that, for example, let me switch my, my screen here, okay? Uh, if you can see here, this is the data test, right? Okay, if you can see it to, the, to my left, this is going to be the data set that I want to use. It has some dates. So what I did was I downloaded the closing, uh, daily closing, uh, you know, prices of the S&P index within a range of 10 years from 2013, uh, uh, you know, starting January to uh, the, the day that I run this, which is what the, the 13th of January. So what I have is prices, the closing prices every day, every day, okay? Then I calculated the return, the daily return of those closings, which is kind of a percentage change of those, you know, daily closings. And then, I added also the volatility, which is the absolute value 
of the return because the return could be positive or negative. So the volatility, daily volatility will be the positive you know, ma uh, values, the magnitude of those, uh, of those returns, okay? And if, if you go to the, you know, to my, to my GitHub, F FPP3 on, underscore exercises, uh, you're going to see the, the script that I did to create this, uh, this data set. But anyway, that's the, you know, kind of the background, right? So we have three time series here. We have the closing, right? We have the daily returns, and then we have the volatility, which is the absolute value of the returns. So what we want to do first is test if the variance of the time series, of the time series is uniform, okay? And we're going to do this BPT test from the LM, LM, LM test package, you know, to test our, our hypothesis. So for the first one, which is the closing, okay? This one here, Okay, this time series here. Um, when you run this test, you get this p value, okay, which is 2.2 to the exponent, right? The, uh, the exponential uh, uh, term 10 to the minus 16. Or in other words, it's a very small uh, number. Okay, so what I do here is that I explain what it, what you know, the the, the conclusion of that test. Since that p-value is less than 0 0.05, which is usually the traditional threshold, okay, greater than 0 0.05, you do not reject the no hypothesis. Less than 0 0.05, then you reject the no hypothesis in favor of the origin. So in this case, that series in particular, the closing one, it says that because the p-value is really small, there's a great chance that variance of that time series is not uniform, okay? And that's going to present some challenges for, you know, inputting into an algorithm. What about the daily returns? The daily returns, well, is basically the same thing, okay? The p-value is very small, less than 0 0.05, so you have a significant, you know, a greater significance, statistical significance that the variance is not uniform, and so the volatility too, okay? So keep that in mind that you know this series you have to test, especially for ARIMA, because ARIMA is based on a regression, uh, you know, a, a formula, auto, in fact, auto regression formula. That's the AR of ARIMA. So make sure that you have it very in mind that you have to do this test, okay? And if if it goes less than 0 0.05, then you have to transform it so that you can try to uniform that variance. Okay. The second term, and that was it was Andres, okay, that mentioned it, and I say, well, you know, at least let me give you, you know, some background of what we're going to be talking this because this is going to be be addressed in chapter eight, and it's called stationary stationarity. Okay. So what do we mean by stationarity or or a stationary time series? In chapter eight point one. There's a good definition from the book that says that a stationary time series is one whose properties do not depend on the time at which the time series is observed. In other words, those points that you see in the time series, they don't have any autocorrelation between them, okay? And that is a major issue when you are using an algorithm like ARIMA. Because ARIMA assumes that those points are autocorrelated or autocorrelated. Okay, that's why you use an auto regression. Okay, in the normal regression, you have an assumption that all those points are independent. Well, in the auto regression world, that's not the case. You know, you need those correlation between that series of points. Good. So. If, uh, if a time series is stationary, that means that you have a problem. Same way as the, as the variance, you have a problem, okay? And you have to, you know, you, you have to see how you can, you can uh, uh, address it. 
if the series is not stationary, in other words, it has a trend, it has a seasonality, etc., then your assumption, you know, fits with that, you know, those algorithms, the arena. So what is the traditional test to detect time series stationarity? Well, the traditional test is called the ADF test. It's called augmented diffuler test. And it's also a hypothesis test. The null hypothesis here is that the time series is non-stationary, right? That's what that's what really what, what we're looking for, right? That is not stationary, that it has a seasonal seasonality, has a trend, all that stuff. Then the alternate hypothesis is that the time series is stationary. Okay, so you want your time series to be the p-value of the test to be greater than 0 0.05, which means that the time series has a greater chance of being non-stationary. If you have a stationary test then you have a problem because you don't have that autocorrelation between those, those points, all right? So for example, taking again those time series, right? They are just the closing. Uh, here, the p-value is 0.319. So that means that we cannot reject the no hypothesis. That, so that time series in particular uh, is non-stationary, okay? Which is the one that we want. What about the daily returns? The ones that were, you know, the percentage changes between, you know, each day of the closing. That one is 0 0.01, okay? So that means that because it's less than 0 0.05, the p-value, you know, threshold, then we have to reject the no hypothesis in favor of the, of the alternate hypothesis, which is, which is, which is that the time is stationary. So you usually won't use uh, an algorithm like ARIMA to try to guess uh, these uh, returns. Because that's one of the assumptions that ARIMA tells you that the time series has to be. It has to be now stationary. And then the volatility has the same thing because the volatility is basically the absolute value. So the p value there is 0 0.01, which is less than 0.5. So also it points that greater chance that that, that, that series stationary okay so i just wanted to give you this you know uh uh information this knowledge because we're going to be you know dealing with this uh, a little more deeper in the next chapters but at least you know more or less you know what is meant by stationarity and what is meant by heteroscedasticity okay good great thank you okay yeah, good. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, Federica, all yours. <laughs> can I ask? Can I ask yeah. a quick question yeah. before we go yeah. to Federica? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, in general, whenever mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. <clears throat> whenever you look at uh, returns in mm -hmm. of stocks and volatilities, in, in you use log returns or um, in log volatilities. Is there a difference when you use log volatility? Right. And the idea is that if you use the log instead of using just raw volatility or raw returns is that the the distribution is normal of the of the log volatilities, whereas the, or the, yeah, the, the log returns, whereas the distribution right. of regular returns is never normal, which is one of the problems why it's difficult to apply any kind of statistical analysis or many statistical analysis. So is there a difference when you do these analysis that you just did um, mm -hmm. when the when you're looking at raw returns versus log returns? Do you know? Uh, the I, I, I believe that the log return is a consequence of the variance uh, test, okay? You know, when you don't have a uniform variance, in other words, as the time series progresses, if you see that those points are, go are growing growing bigger or growing smaller, that means that that variance is not uniform. So if you use an algorithm like ARIMA, for example, that assumes that the variance is, is, is uh, steady, is uniform, then you have to use a, a log transform. It could be you know, plain log, or it could be a box cox uh, transformation. It could be a Geo Johnson transformation, if you have zeros, for example, 
okay, that the box cause is going to give you some problems, then you do that. But those are all transformations based on, on logarithms, okay? Uh, but I, I believe that that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the response because of the, of the issue of the stereoscedasticity, okay? More than the Gaussian, you know, uh, hypothesis, okay? Uh, right. But there's ways, there's ways that you can deal with it. There's a, there's a methodology called GARGE, okay? ARCH, GARGE, that also deals with this, with this issue, okay? And it's, a, it's kind of a tweak to ARIMA to try to incorporate those errors that comes from a variance that is no unit, okay? Uh, but uh, yeah, but the, the thing is that in time series, uh, you have to, you know, you have a little bit of your assumptions sometimes because of that autocorrelation that is expected, you know, to be, for example, you know, the, the previous uh, value should be a predictor of value, right? That is our correlation what we're talking about. That's something that doesn't happen usually in, in, in regular uh, data sets that the temporal component, the day component or time component is not there, all right? Uh, but, you know, let, let's keep with the chapter. Let's keep uh, learning a little bit and you'll see, you know, what I'm telling you about those assumptions when we get into the, those algorithms, okay? Okay. Okay, Farika, all yours. So you. I think uh, I need to share my screen. Okay, so this is the next chapter and straightforward. So we just have a, a quick look at what we, is the main, how our time series is composed and how we can uh, decompose a time series to select some components that will uh, let us to uh, understand that the, better the trend um, that we are um, research. So um, the learning, can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yep. Learning objectives are how to split a time series into several components, combine trend and cycle into a single trend cycle component, extracting components from a time series. Okay, to simplify the pattern in the historical data, uh, we uh, basically remove the unknown sources of variation. So we remove the unknown sources of variation and do some adjustments. So this is the first thing that we need to uh, think about. And then uh, as any other uh, like tidy data adjustments, uh, we adjust our data um, following our objectives. So like we can we do we can do calendar adjustments, so we like to year month or just month and everything. Uh, or, um, we, we should do publicity adjustments if data are per person uh, or per thousand. Uh, that, that would be rather better than have just the total. So like grouping things and tidy your data. So this is uh, our, and then there's a, uh, this inflection adjustment um this is when uh, uh, we are dealing with for example price indexes so we do some adjustments like considering the average the um some some things that will uh, just let us able to focalize on what we are uh, we need i'm telling i'm saying this because uh, sometimes you attempt to make a time series and then you the results of your visualization is like a massive of things so that you cannot see any, uh, nothing at all. So um, the best way to do this is selecting precisely 
and focusing on the objective, adjusting your data, targeting your data and everything. So in a way that you can extrapolate your your time series. The, the last um, bit of transformation that is might be required following uh, our previous discussion, you know, if you uh, understand that the series are some, uh, you know, I don't know, metastasis or um, it's not stationary or maybe it's stationary. So you need to, uh, you can do, uh, or maybe the D residual, so you, you see that it's not behaving normally uh, and everything. You can, you can do some mathematical transformation on your data and you, apply, you can apply the log or the power function or a box box transformation. So you can do all those things on your data before attempting the, the decomposition and these are the transformation and adjustments. Um, this is a nice, uh, this Guerrero's method. Uh, it's a nice method. I don't know if you uh, had a look at the, at the thing, but um, it's a basically a way to calculate the lambda from the box cox uh, transformation. So you know that the box cox transformation uses a certain level of lambda. And uh, this Guerrero method is a way to uh, basically calculate a range of uh, lambda or a, um, an average of this range of lambda that would be set on your feature. And this is uh, going back to, uh, because um, I did another book club, no? Feature Engineering. And on Feature Engineering, we talked about the, all these transformations. No? Uh, and this is nice because this package, FPP3, which is the package of the, this book, uh, provides some functions which are very interesting, like features and a function. So you can use, like, this, are, this is your data, and you can use features. The, what this function does is selecting the variable that you uh, want to apply the transformation, and um, uh, calculate the, the uh, possible lambda, and this time uses Guerrero methods, but you can use others, uh, or you can set the range. Or, you know. So, and then you use pull, and it pull, pulls out the, the, the lambda value. Uh, okay, so this is Australia. Uh, so basically, is the uh, in the in the book? Okay. So we had this. Um, uh, where is it? Okay. This uh, um, Australian uh, values that we have extrapolated from the global economy data set. Okay. You have this global economy that is actually filtered to Australia, et cetera. Okay. I'm, I'm not saying. So, anyway, you have this uh, uh, Australia production. And uh, uh, if you do the auto plot, if you use the auto plot function, then you can use the box cock transformation on the lambda that you just uh, calculated and the gas uh, variable. And uh, you can see that the, the uh, time series here, uh, in, in the book shows uh, that you can have different values, so it changes slightly. Uh, the, 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 the shape of this trend changes slightly if you change the values of lambda. But uh, after a few considerations, which I've done with this uh, um, feature function for calculating lambda with the Guerrero's method, it turns out that these values of lambda, 0 0.1, 0 0.11, is the best one around a certain range. It's, it's steady, it's about the same. So uh, with these values of lambda, of lambda, we can see that this system can be considered as is. And uh, um, so you see that there is a, 
um, massive increase um, within around the, the 70s on about gas production. And then uh, steady, 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 steady increase, uh, which it seems like um, stabilizing uh, overall in the in the in the future. So okay, so this is the first uh, thing. So, so we are uh, on this uh, time series. Now we like to. Look at this time series a bit a bit more in depth. Okay, we um, uh, know that the time series are made of three components, which are a trend cycle, a seasonal component, and a reminder component. And these are uh, identified with this letter C, F, and R. Okay, um, there is a, a, a little uh, introduction in the chapter about the, the classical level of decomposition, which is additive and multipli multiplicative. So uh, what's happened here is that you um, can uh, are in a, a situation of an additive um, time series. Uh, and so you can decompose your time series this way. When uh, the variation around the trend cycle doesn't vary. So this is stationary. Okay, so when the variation around the trend cycle doesn't vary with the level of the time series, we are uh, in a situation of additive decomposition. While uh, when the variation is in the seasonal pattern or around, around the trend cycle appears to be proportional, to the level of time series, we are in a, a multiplicative decomposition. So mm, you, the, these values are powered to each other. And uh, alternatively, uh, we can use a log transformation. And so as because of the properties of the log logarithm, you, it turns out to be an additive composition of the log transformation. Okay, so the, the chapter basically repeats always the same things, and but mention the fact that these two are the classical methods for decomposing a time series, and they have been um, um, I use it, um, and there, there are some some examples here. If we take this uh, U.S. employment, uh, there is a nice introduction of the package. Uh, I I put the link. You can find the notes in the in the shared notes because they are already up. This is a very nice introduction of the package, and there is a, a, an example at this minute 13, where you can, uh, he shows how to use the package and the, the, the functions. Um, uh, and it is basically what we, are, what we are going to do here. Uh, if we take this uh, unemployment, US unemployment, employment uh, data set, you can see, uh, know about. Um, so here, start immediately with using a specified decomposition method, which is this STL, and, and it is the seasonal and trend decomposition using the lowest. So this is a special model, okay? It, it's a special model. What it does is decomposing the, the, the time series and applying the model. Okay, all in one function, and uh, it does some 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 stuff, some interesting stuff. So you find some information here. Uh, I can um, put it in the chat. Uh, maybe is um, uh, this is one uh, that 
give some information. In fact, it says SPL. Um, so this this um, type of model produces a smoother trend compared to classical other decomposition methods due to the use of local polynomial regression. So this is not classical decomposition. Okay, this is an alternative. And um, this article in particular talks about decomposition and then inside you find this information. And more, uh, it's here. In this other uh, link, which is another link, um, it, it, this link is provided in the chapter. It talks uh, exactly about uh, this, this package. So um, this package, this model. So if we uh, have a quick look at the characteristics of, of this uh, SPL model, uh, this model is additive. It's interactive and relies on alternative, alternate estimation of trends. Um, here, decisional components are locally estimated, and you can look at it with a scatter plot smoothing loss. Uh, there is quite a, um, emphasized, it, uh, um, it's emphasized as a model used as a um, decomposition method compared to other methods. Uh, the chapter, uh, so basically the book, talks about other, other, other methods, but this one is, let's say, the favorite, okay, and, uh, and it is suggested. Um, there are some, some uh, conditions for which you cannot use it, or it's better for you to use the other, other methods that we are going to have a look uh, in a few minutes. Um, Let's let's have a look at the characteristics. So it's additive, iterative. Uh, you have seasonal components. Mm, it's able to estimate non-linear relationships, uh, and the seasonal component is allowed to change over time. So basically, as as you, when you apply more, when you do modeling and you apply a model, you have some data. Not strictly time series, you need to identify the type of model that which is which will be the best to use okay, for, for your data. Uh, in time series, obviously, the, 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 um, the possibility of uh, uh, selected uh, type of models. And uh, even here, you need to think about uh, the type of time series you are uh, dealing with to uh, focalize on the, the best model to use. Okay, this, this one here, for example, um, when we, we are going to be talking about K, and the K parameter uh, is a key parameter, which um, in this model controls how radically the seasonal component can change, but in general, the K element uh, that you choose to be um, of a certain number. It's very important because, for example, you use a, 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 a special K when you do a moving average, okay? And a moving average is for, uh, it's not a simple average. So you use you like uh, shift your data of three days, five days, seven days, you know, and, and then you calculate the mean to see uh, uh, how your trend could change if you focalize on three days shift, five days shift, or seven days shift. So K, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an important value, that parameter that you can uh, control uh, and adjust. So in this model, uh, K adjusts radically on the seasonal component, and this can change. It's a robust model to outliers and missing data. Uh, and so it is able to decompose the time series with seasonality and frequency and provide implementation using numerical methods instead of mathematical modeling. Um, 
more about this, this particular model, type of model. It's in the book, and there is a, a paragraph dedicated. Uh, so we are not going back to, to that. Uh, instead, we see that uh, how, to, how to apply this model with, with this um, uh, FTP3 package is using the, the model function. So you use the model function and then the type of model. So you basically, instead of you know, when you do a modeling, the linear model, for example, use the LM function and apply the model. Here, there is a model function, and then inside the model function, you specify the type of model. In this case, we have this STL uh, type of model, and inside you put the formula. Going back to the data, so we have this US employment data, okay? So we filter to the uh, all values that are greater and equal than the 90s, and then uh, select the retail trade. So we have a new data set. Uh, and then what we do is apply the model to this new data set. So basically select the outcome uh, variable, the employed level on all the other variables, except the series ID, because it's not uh, like mean pool. Um, and then, uh, so this is this our model. Let, let's go uh, to my R, back to my R, and have a quick look at what's happened here. Okay, so this is the data set. Uh, this is the data set, okay. So what we did here, it's a new uh, okay, this is the result of a, um, so this is our new data set. We apply the model, and this is the, the result of the model. You can see nothing like this. You just have these results. You know that you are using the STL. But then if you use this function, and now this is the interesting part. This is a function that it's component, named component. So then you use this component on, 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 on the model. What components does, OK? Okay, this is the function, and what does is in um, generic is the components in table ops, which is a, this is table tools, and it is one of the package inside the FTP3 package. Okay, so this uh, okay. component, so extract the components from a fitted model. Okay. How does is we cannot see it uh, because if I uh, because you so know this is after the function, yeah. So this is not a function of uh, of a FPP three. This is a, a function from another package. The because components FP, one. F, FPP three is a meta package. So there's one uh, more than one package inside. In fact, if you check the various functions that are used as well as model, for example, we have a look at the this function here, model. You see that model as well. It's from this table tools 
And stable tools is one of the meta the, the package inside the meta package. Okay. Got and, it. But yeah, what I was saying is if I want to have a look at inside, so what, what this function does, and I do this, you see that you cannot see it because the function is locked. So there's many methods that can be used with this component. So you need to use this uh, methods component. So this way you can see all the methods they are uh, they can be used with the, with this function. Okay, so we use the components with uh, and to on a model state. Okay, so the, the result is a new data set, and as you can see, what we got here is the we got the components. Okay, we have the trend, which is the T variable. We have the season here and the season adjust. And then we have the reminder. So these are the three um, components of our time series. So then if you put them as a TS table, You, you see that then you can use it differently. Uh, I did this to, to show you um, because I selected just the, 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 the variables that we need. And then um, if we do a table, a CS table, then we can use auto plot on the, uh, so basically, the, what class is this uh, uh, component, uh, etc. It's a it's a data frame. It's a table. It's a table. So I don't know if I use auto plot on this. What's gonna happen? I didn't tell it, but we we are we are able to achieve the same result. Okay. Um, most probably doing these other passages uh, lets you uh, apply some uh, features. So if I do this, uh, I'm selected. I have selected just the employed and. Um, so the main time series, not the other components. And then I add a line, the ggplot, geom line, geom line, for the trend and the season adjustment. Oops. Okay, this is nice. Uh, but if I zoom it, I don't know. Okay, can you see very big? Yeah, we can okay. see it. Underneath is our original time series. On top we have this bluish. Okay, this. You can see that I made it like a bit, little bit bigger for you to to see and and transparent for you to see. How how changes when on top we see the seasonality? The, the red line is the season part of the component of the time series. So gray is the original, bluish is the trend, red is the season seasonality. So can, can you see? Because when you do uh, at least is what I learned uh, from the chapter, from the book, is that anytime you do a moving average, and so you uh, are dealing, you are uh, like uh, dealing with identifying the trend of your time series, 
then what's happen uh, is that you can deal with the and modifying and adjusting the trend so deciding which one is the best trend dealing with the seasonality so looking at the trend and the seasonality on top of the sorry, sorry Federica, can you say yeah. that again can you can you can you say that again what the, what you said that you the that was your biggest finding from the from the chapter is that when you uh, are um, attempting to identify the trend, the best trend of your time series, then you um, deal with the, with the seasonality. You need to deal with the seasonality for uh, identify the best trend of your time series. You can yeah. see that the seasonality here uh for example like uh, let, let's focus on the 2000 okay 2000 you see that this peak here for example okay in the seasonality that's something that goes with the trend around with the trend and uh, you might want to adjust it better a little better if you like adding some changing the k variable I show you something else that maybe uh, can be like clear. Sorry about that. Okay, so basically, what happened is that when we do the composition, we can go back to the. Uh, when we do the composition, we have uh, um, a main trend. Uh, sorry, the temp, our original time series, the trend, the seasonality, in this case yearly, and then we have a reminder. This reminder is this bit here, the very little changes that you got uh, on top. In fact, if you attempt to plot, to plot one on top of the other, these last two bits are very at the bottom, so you cannot plot them uh, on top of each other because this is a different scale. Um, this is a part of your uh, time series, and as you can see, it might be very confusing because to identify a trend on this one here. Because it looks like quite simple, but at the same time very um, high. So what I was saying now, uh, we've got a few minutes left, but we, we're, we're nearly to the end. Because uh, the, the book goes back to the classical decomposition, which is additive uh, and multiplicative decomposition. For that, mention the moving average. So basically, a classical method of uh, decomposition uh, average method is and is used to estimate the trend cycle and originated in the twenties and widely used until the fifties. Average in a moving average, you have a seasonal period, and this is M. Okay. Then M is made of this two K, two times K plus one. This is the famous K, okay? This K in the moving image, for example, lets you identify, the, set the K to, if you have like a moving image of three days, okay? M is three would be the three days. And K would be, in this case, one. OK, so then you change the K to change the seasonal period for drawing uh, your trend using the moving average.
Okay, this is one divided by M. This is your day, like three days, five days, seven days. And then this is the sum uh, of your values. To go back to something practice, okay. Thank you. 
Can you hear uh, Federica well? I'm hearing a little bit of a, you know, a cut. No, I can't. I can't hear her very well. It's cutting in and out. I thought it was me, so I logged off and then I I, I logged back in. But right. I can hear you very well, so I'm guessing it might be Federica's <clears throat> um, microphone. Yes, uh -huh. yes, now, I was, now it's better. Yeah, I was closing things furiously, starting th thinking I had run out of memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically, okay. uh, yeah, so I don't know if you'd like to uh continue next time so we can have a look at the exercises as well, a couple of, at least, yeah. What yeah, and I was going to make a recommendation, okay, to make the most of it, that we should focus on exercise five, mm. okay? That, that's in 3.7. Exercise five, which is the application of the box Cox transformation to different series. And then, to do a decomposition, I would recommend. Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, number five. And if we have some time, let's do also number 10. Okay. Yeah, in number 10, you can also practice from the previous chapter, uh, you know, the, the visualizations and then do the do the uh, STL decomposition. Okay. Okay, so uh, exercise five and, and 10. Yep, that sounds good. Can't hear you, Fadi. Uh -huh. You're on mute. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. So I, I was saying uh, I'd like to take like 15 minutes at uh, the beginning of the session for finish up this uh, um, mm -hmm. this, this last uh, paragraph. And then uh, uh, we, we, get, we, so we keep going forward uh, with the exercise. Okay. Yeah, sounds that good. would be good. That sounds great. Hmm. Oh, great notes, by the way, Federica. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, have a nice weekend. <laughs> Bye, guys.